good structural design can be said to be the efficient use of resources to produce a structure that won't fall down and will do what we intend it to do. That is, carry the traffic, look attractive, be easy to maintain. Compare the fourth road bridge built in 1964 with the neighbouring fourth railway bridge built in 1890. Why are they the shape they are? Are all those numbers required? How did the engineers who designed them decide what thickness and therefore what strength to make each piece? How did the engineers ensure that each member was strong enough to resist the forces applied to the member? Let's look at a typical project. The first thing is to define the problem. Currently, communication between these three urban centres is poor because the only way across the estuary is by ferry. So what are we trying to achieve? What about a bridge? Or will that interfere with the shipping? What about a tunnel? Every possibility must be considered. Various factors lead us to a bridge, and this leads to other questions. What loads will be applied to the bridge? What about the structure itself? What resources are available for its design and construction? Obviously, resources and technology change. What form should the bridge take? Foundations in the river would not be acceptable here because of shipping requirements. The span is too large for an arch bridge and the foundations would be unable to resist the horizontal thrusts. A suspension bridge is necessary for this span. What should the bridge be made of? It should be strong but light as it has to support its own weight. So a material with a high strength to weight ratio is required. It also needs to be stiff enough so as not to deflect too much. It should be sufficiently durable to last, not be too expensive, be easy to produce in the shapes required, be easy to join together readily available at the time and place required. For members' intention, such as the cables, a material with a very high tensile strength for its weight is used, like this wire. For members in compression, like the tower, a material with a high compressive strength, like concrete, is used. It's necessary to test the materials to check their strength. The purpose of the analysis of a structure is to find the forces in each member. Starting with the load of the bridge deck and surfacing, and then adding the load of traffic, the tensile forces in the suspenders are calculated. These forces are then applied to the cables, not forgetting the weight of the cables themselves, to obtain the forces in the cables. From these, the forces on the car can be calculated. Hence, having found all the forces in the structure and knowing how strong the chosen materials are, it's possible to decide how large each member needs to be. Of course, an adequate safety factor needs to be included, and it is essential to check that all the assumed loads are sufficiently accurate. The designers have to decide whether their design wants minor refining or a complete rethink. They may decide to reconsider their choice of material or their choice of structural arrangement. Perhaps it's worth looking at some alternatives and comparing them. Alternatively, it may be that by a slight change of structural arrangement, an improvement could be obtained. 
remember that there is no perfect design that is one that cannot be improved. In reality, refinement or looking at alternatives cannot go on indefinitely if a structure is to be built. After the decision to proceed, a final check that the structure meets all the objectives should be made before starting construction. Let us look at the whole sequence. First define the problem, then choose the materials and choose the structural arrangement, then test the material and analyse the structure to find the forces in the members, select the sizes of material for each member, does the design need further refinement? Does the design meet the requirements? Do you think we can modify Leeds University design? Civil Engineering yeah. Department yeah. attempts yeah. to develop yeah. structural yeah. design yeah. skills yeah. in yeah. student yeah. engineers yeah. by structural yeah. project work. In their yeah. first year, yeah. the students have to produce yeah. a design yeah. for a structural yeah. solution yeah. to a problem. We use um, the straw to tie up this one as well. Yeah. I'm thinking more they then have to build and test their proposals to check that they achieve their objectives. An assessment is also made of the quantity of resources necessary for their design for comparison with others. Because it would be far too expensive to build full-size civil engineering structures and then load them up only to find that they were not strong enough, small-scale models are used. However, the principles of structural design are the same as for the full-size, real-life structures, even if the consequences of failure are not. <laughs> Consider the problem of how best to support a load of one kilogram, or ten newtons, at the centre of the rectangular space without applying any horizontal force to the edge using the least quantity of spaghetti. An arch could not be used as it would apply horizontal loads to the supports. Clearly some sort of beam is a possible solution and it's going to require less material if it spans the short distance rather than the longer. But how strong and how stiff do we need to make the beam? By testing one piece in bending and finding it will carry 10 grams or a tenth of a newton, we could estimate that with 100 pieces of spaghetti, this should be adequate to carry the load. It doesn't matter whether these are spread out or in a bundle, providing the load is spread evenly between them. A more efficient solution would be obtained by sticking the pieces together so that instead of having one piece slide over another, they acted as a single beam, then only 20 pieces would be required. Note how the top pieces of spaghetti are now being compressed, that is, they are in compression, whereas the bottom pieces of spaghetti are being stretched, they are in tension. Some of the spaghetti in the middle is hardly doing anything. Hence we might concentrate the members at the top and bottom of the section, where they'd work harder. This would mean that only 10 pieces of spaghetti were required. We can extend this idea by separating our members into a frame structure. This can be a very efficient way to use spaghetti, as the equivalent of only four pieces will be required. Note that the member forces are essentially axial with little, if any, bending. However, some care is needed in how you connect the top and bottom cord. Contrast a triangular arrangement with a rectangular arrangement. As the triangular arrangement frame is loaded, the forces in the constituent members are essentially axial. But when the rectangular arrangement is loaded, the members are loaded in bending. The difference can be well illustrated if we simplify our frames to being pin-jointed. That is, assuming that at each joint the members are free to rotate just as if they really were connected with a frictionless pin.
This is a very common assumption in real structural design because it makes design easier and gives answers which are not far from the truth. Our triangular arrangement would still be satisfactory, whereas our rectangular arrangement would be a mechanism. It would require the addition of the four diagonal members to turn it into a structure. We would then call it statically determinate, as there are just enough members to form a structure, and it would be easy to analyze. Having decided on an arrangement, provided it's statically determinate, we can analyze it to find the magnitude of the forces using any one of such standard methods as resolution of forces at joints, method of sections, graphical techniques, or tension coefficients. We find that we have compression in the top chord, tension in the bottom chord, and alternate tension and compression in the internal members. We now know how strong we need to make each of these members so as to make our structure strong enough to carry the load. Once we've chosen the structural arrangement and the materials, if we don't know how strong our materials are, then we have to test them. For example, this piece of spaghetti is very strong in tension. When testing a material in compression, its strength depends on its length. A slender compression member will fail at a small load, whereas a short, stocky piece will carry a much larger load. So load is in inverse proportion to length. One way of making a long, slender member carry a higher load is effectively to reduce its length by restraining it. The forces required to restrain the member are not large. In practice, a force equal to 2.5% or a 40th of the member's force is assumed to be sufficient. However, the extra material needed to restrain the compression member will need to be balanced against the increased load it will take. Knowing how strong our materials are and knowing how large the force in the member will be, we can calculate how large the member needs to be. Of course, all materials will vary in strength between one piece and another. Some pieces will be stronger and some weaker than others. Because failure of one member can cause overall collapse, we wish to be on the safe side. Furthermore, in normal use, we do not want our structures to be just on the point of collapse. We'd like some margin of safety. The safety margin can be introduced in several ways, but usually it's done by using in the design calculations a material strength which is less than the actual material, as well as a load that is higher than the actual load. This is done by dividing the actual material strength by a partial safety factor for materials to obtain a design strength to be used in calculations. The load to be used in the design calculations is increased by multiplying the actual load by a partial safety factor for loads. The magnitude of these safety factors varies with the situation and depends on what has been found reasonable by experience. If the safety factors are too small, there will be too many failures, and if the safety factors are too great, there will be materials and resources wasted. Three-dimensional effects must be considered. A two-dimensional frame needs adequate restraint in the third dimension. Without the lateral restraint, the frame fails by lateral instability at a low load. Once again, the magnitude of the force to restrain it is actually very small. There are several ways that this restraint can be provided. If there were a convenient stiff member parallel, then the frame could be linked to the stiff member. Where there isn't a convenient stiff member, the same effect could be achieved by splitting the frame into two parallel frames and bracing them together. The bracing or restraining members can be very thin as they only have to withstand small forces to provide the necessary restraint. The cross-section has very little resistance to movement like this. 
including a diagonal member, is an extremely effective way of preventing this type of failure. If the member can take tension and compression, then only one member is required. Often, very light, tension-only members are used, in which case two members will be required. We should now have a design that will satisfactorily carry the load. Decide whether it's worth improving it, then a final check before we start building it. Let's have a look and see how some students dealt with this problem. They had to produce a crane jib which would support a load of 350 grams at a horizontal distance of 300 millimeters from the center of rotation and out to a horizontal distance of 700 millimeters. They were allowed to use any material they liked, but the design that used the least weight of material and supported the required loads would be regarded as the winner. This design used drinking straws. The strength to weight ratio is good, in particular the compressive strength to weight ratio as a circular section is a very efficient use of material in compression. It's difficult to vary the section by having half a straw, but some students did so when the strength of only half a straw was required. Jointing of straws is not too easy, but these students achieved it by a welding technique they developed. This design uses spaghetti. The strength to weight ratio is good, it's difficult to vary the section by having half a piece of spaghetti if that's all that is required. It is relatively easy to joint together once a suitable glue and technique have been developed. It is rather brittle and poor handling. This design uses bamboo. The strength to weight ratio is good and it's possible to vary the section by sandpapering or cutting. It's easy to joint. This design uses balsa wood. The strength to weight ratio is very good and it's very easy to vary the section by cutting or sandpapering. It's also very easy to build up any section desired and easy to make joints. Most students had experience of working with this material and chose it in preference to the others. This is a very straightforward design. Note how by turning it upside down there would be no force in those end members and they could have been omitted. That's what they've done here but all the members are much stronger than they need to be. This design weighed more than six times the lightest design and yet was not as strong. Did they really intend loading to be halfway between the joints or was this an error between the design and actual building of the structure? This member is heavily loaded in bending, as well as compression. This design has saved weight by going for a triangular cross-section with a single tension member, but the design still uses the end cross member to support the load in bending. In view of the strength of balsa wood and the section used, the design is uneconomic. These designers have appreciated that the tension member can be much thinner than the compression member, as it will not buckle. Here they seem to have half appreciated the advantages of a triangular cross section, but have put the single member into compression rather than tension. They've also found themselves with a triangle on its apex, which is not the most stable of arrangements. Although weighing almost four times the weight of the lightest successful design, it failed to carry the design load. This is a lighter design, but still essentially unstable with the apex of the triangle at the bottom. Here, they have not only used the triangle section, but they have also sensibly tapered the section in plan so that all members are taking only axial load. The members appear to be approaching the ideal of following the lines where the forces want to go. Here's a similar sort of arrangement, but it's higher over the front support. This reduces the magnitude of the forces, but increases the length of some of the members. The length between restraint on the compression members is greater, which has saved on restraining members, but has necessitated a larger section for the compression member. A rather complex design. It's not clear where the designer thinks the forces are supposed to be going. 
an interesting idea to save weight by using paper for the tension members. A flaw in the idea is that to prevent the main compression member from buckling upwards, these pieces of paper are put into compression, which they're incapable of taking. As you can see, the compression member in this design buckles in the vertical plane, though it is well constrained from buckling in the horizontal plane. A particularly elegant design with the members where the forces are. Note how the compression members have been shaped to increase the stiffness in the middle so that it does not buckle in either the vertical or horizontal plane. A quite different solution. By rotating the support framework, the problem has been solved by essentially two components, the thin tension members at the top and a single compression member at the bottom. The material in the compression member has been spread out to make it stiffer as a whole so that it won't buckle. The four individual pieces of this compression member have been laced together to prevent the individual members buckling. The weight of these various structures has varied by a factor of six between the lightest and the heaviest. For a full-size structure, this ratio would be exaggerated, since a major proportion of a larger structure's strength is required to hold itself up. The waste of resources, and hence cost of the poorer designs, would be considerable, although the cost of a collapse might be much higher. But in general, the poorer designs were than the best designs.